was it directed to me? Yeah, uh, are we ready? Okay, great. Welcome everyone. Good morning. Welcome to everyone that is on site. Um, I wish we can all be together, but it's a great opportunity to be able to test <laughs> the flexibility of those platforms. I'm very happy to be with you uh, in the distance and to open this plenary. Um, Welcome to also to everyone who is on the platform um, joining us online. I hope it's working well. I have I can still hear some music in the background for the online, so I hope the other participants are able to hear me, at least with the music, if not instead of the music. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, so as I said, welcome everyone. Uh, very happy to be here and to discuss with you all this important topic, um, the AI and sustainability uh, challenges and opportunity as part of the uh, Sustainability and Research and Innovation Congress 2022. I've been hearing that the Congress is going great and excited to be here and to have this plenary to introduce you a little bit more to what we are doing at UNESCO. Uh, and to have the great uh, three speakers with us two on site, Emma and Johan, whom I will introduce um, shortly, and uh, Constanza, who is joining us uh, online, same as me, uh, which I will definitely, of course, also introduce very soon. But before I start, let me just uh, briefly kind of tell you what we are doing at the bioethics and ethics of technology section at UNESCO, which is part of the social and human um, sciences sections. Um, so dealing with ethics of technology and ensuring that scientific advantages and emerging technologies, any new technology that is introduced, being introduced to us is in line with human rights and fundamental freedom and ethics is at its core is one of the main reasons uh, why this section is operational and that was the mandate. This is the only section in the UN that is, has the mandate to deal with ethics. And we see it ethics as a, as a broad term that umbrella terms that enable us to deal with values and rights that are already anchored into law but also principles and values that have not been yet anchored in international um, guidelines and uh, international laws in national laws. So it enables us to be broadening, broader and more uh, overarching. Uh, we in the section are working on the development of on standard setting, meaning on developing different instruments and guidelines uh, for the ethics of technology. Uh, mainly in the domains of bioethics and ethics of science. Today, you will hear in detail about two of these instruments, the uh, instruments that has been adopted uh, last November, the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence and the instrument that has been adopted in 2017 on the ethics of climate change. Um, those instruments set the scene uh, for member states to later on uh, incorporate them, in some cases incorporate them in their national law uh, and to have a guidelines uh, that are in line with them. Uh, they will also, they are also helping us in UNESCO to work with member states on capacity building and on unpacking them into more uh, operational tasks that member states can uh, work with. Those instruments are developed, I mean, they can be developed by ad hoc committees, like was the case uh, in the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. We had a committee of 24 um, members that I believe Emma might uh, say more about it in her presentation, um, specialized in artificial intelligence, in ethics of AI from all over the world. Uh, and also the aspiration and the background work that leads to those instruments 
also come from our committees. We are leading two international committees, the International Bioethics Committee, the IBC, and COMEST, which is the World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific um, Knowledge and Technology. Uh, our speakers are both all active in different capacities in those uh, committees and specialized group that we are establishing. So there is no better people to talk about those instruments and their implementation uh, than our speakers today. So I've spoke for um, long enough, I believe. Uh, I'll introduce the speakers and um, the way we will um, operate this panel. We, each of our speaker will um, have a presentation of, of for approximately 15, 20 minutes. And after that, we will be able to take questions uh, both uh, from the on-site participants and from the online partic uh, from the online platform. So if you have any question during the talks, of course, uh, feel free to post it and, uh, and we will get to it hopefully um, after the talks. Um, let me just uh, uh... okay. So our first uh, speaker is uh, Johan Hatting. Uh, he is an emeritus professor of philosophy at the University of uh, Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch. Uh, he was a member of the UNESCO World Commission on the Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology Commerce between 2004 to 2011. And he was the president of the UNESCO ad hoc um, expert group the task was preparing a draft of the declaration of the ethics uh, on principles re in relation to climate change adopted in 2017. Um, in the last 30 years, he is specialized in applied ethics, uh, ideologies, uh, development, uh, and, and in particular, in innovation and ethics of uh, climate change. Uh, so he will talk about the uh, declaration and uh, what will be amazing to hear your reflection. Johan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your words of introduction. And uh, also, good morning, and good, good morning to every one of you here in the room. And I also would like to acknowledge everyone <clears throat> on the platform. My theme, and I just would like to have my slides on on display. Uh, they will show quickly. There they are. Uh, my theme will be reflections on UNESCO's declaration of ethical principles in relation to uh, climate change. And I would like to um, start with three. Uh, preliminary remarks, more or less about ethics and, and what is ethics. But first thing is perhaps to uh, acknowledge that it may be strange to introduce ethics and ethics talk at a meeting like this, which is very practical, financing, uh, research, policy, uh, networks, etc. Et, et and uh, I would like to use the metaphor of a, an iceberg, perhaps, to, to explain why this may, may seem strange. Ethics talks, yes, about actions and uh, uh, choices and, and interactions, but it talks about it in a way in which it questions that. It does not talk about that just only on a descriptive level. When we go below the surface uh, and move beyond what is visible, we also uh, talk about structures and institutions and uh, functions and operations um, and norms and standards by which they, they, they operate. And yes, ethics talks about that, but also in a way of uh, asking whether everything is in order with things going on there. But then where ethics really comes into its own, I think, is when it starts to talk about the mental models, the assumptions, the values and the principles underlying the above, the institutions and our actions and so on. 
And when we, when we flip this iceberg and when we, we start to confront ourselves with those very, very deep motivational uh, parts, strange things uh, start uh, to, to happen. Um, so, and this is because ethics is in the broad sense about the standards we set for our choices and our behavior and how we justify them. It does not only talk about descriptively and how we use them, but it also scrutinizes them, assess them, question them, challenge them, and perhaps even transform them. So there's always this critical intent with ethics. Um, talking about how we make distinctions between right and wrong, good and bad, what is admirable and, and, and deserves respect, what is not. He talks about what we can expect of others and, of, and others of us, uh, what can be forgiven and what can not be forgiven. And ethics then in broad has to do with our lives, how we, how we live our lives in the best possible way and what it means to live a good life with and for others in just and sustainable institutions. So this, this without others, I would like to say ethics is not actually necessary. We can then go, go home and uh, because there will not be any, any questions uh, to ask. Um, and life with others, of course, uh, require institutions, uh, as I said, which could be uh, assessed whether they are just uh, and also whether they are stable and continue into the future. Now, when we set these standards, we enter into big debates and we don't uh, always find consensus on them and there's always an ongoing discussion about these themes. They are contested, they are contestable, we argue about them, but there's one thing which we are basically very good at, I think all of us, we all know when something is unethical. We know when something goes wrong in a picture. What we do when we say something is unethical is we put a badge of shame on it. We identify it as an affront, as an outrage, as disturbing and scandalous. It angers us. We cannot support it in good faith, we say, uh, with a good conscience. We cannot be associated with that. So we often resign from our posts when we, uh, when we uh, see, say something is unethical. Uh, and why is that? Because in unethical behavior, others are harmed uh, or not considered. We choose often the self over others. Others are treated as things less than as persons. What we say is that the dignity of others are often then undermined. So it is important to note that ethics in this sense is never a private matter. It is always something where accountability is required and where accountability is perfectly legitimate, where to make judgment is actually perfectly legitimate. Uh, ethics requires requires from us to stand up for something. Now, if we shift this quickly to the climate change debate, uh, when we were busy with, uh, in our group studying climate ethics, uh, there were a number of ethical concerns around climate change that we really considered uh, from the start. And of course, the first ones would be, would be, the first worry would be, would be harm. Uh, the harm that climate change can bring because of extreme weather events, droughts, floods, wildfires, <clears throat> rising sea levels, etc. Loss of livelihoods, displacement, migration, climate, refugees, etc., etc. Um, but not only these direct harms, but also the fact that we as humans tend to discount these harms. We somehow normalize these harms. And ethics also asks questions about why we do this uh, and, 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 and uh, why and how we do this discounting. But we also took into account that responses to climate change are also can cause huge ethical problems. Uh, 
responses in, in the sense of mitigation and adaptation, the current trend uh, and uh, to uh, the transition to a zero, uh, zero carbon economy. And furthermore, harms to future generations, harms to other than the human world. All of these harms, possible harms, have been identified as points of concern to take into, into account. Um, furthermore, the uh, problem of inaction because of the insistence on perfect scientific certainty. We often find that in uh, geopolitics the world over, uh, states and actors try not to do anything about climate change because of the insistence on a perfect scientific certainty. And while climate science, sustainability science in many instances, is not an exact science, there are always margins of uncertainty, exactly that has been often used against uh, any, any action. We also take into, took into account the impact of climate change on uh, sustainable development and biodiversity, agricultural production, uh, and, and, and things like that. And then also the big questions about injustices, uh, call them climate injustices, where it is uh, the injustices of exclusion, exclusion from resources and benefits, from decision making, um, with the already marginalized suffer the effects first and more intense and for longer, but still have contributed uh, the least to climate change. And then another concern, a big concern, was the phenomenon that often when disasters happen and strike, victims are assisted for a very, very short time, maybe on humanitarian grounds, but then it, th that, that quickly dwindles, dwindles away. So you have victims that that suffer and suffer alone for a long time. And often we find and have considered the problem that resources are not shared. Resources are not shared uh, with, uh, um, resources uh, of uh, knowledge, technology, early warning systems, etc. cetera. Um, so, Six very big questions that also uh, uh, arrive, and which we considered was the fact that, um, can I say, this ingenuousness around science itself, that available science, but also local knowledge and indigenous knowledge systems were not properly used uh, to plan for climate change and uh, responding it. And together with this went the whole problem of science denial, actually, not only discounting the future or discounting nature, but also discounting the truth. So against these um, very big concerns, um, and the principles of climate change that were adopted in our declaration of 2017 were the fairly obvious, obvious ones, the prevention of harm, uh, and there's a long uh, description of that. The precautionary approach to act uh, to avoid if there is a present danger, uh, a clear and present danger of it, uh, even in the light of scientific uncertainty. Uh, sustainable development explicitly linked to the sustainable development goals. Uh, equity and justice to avoid discrimination and ex uh, the exclusion, to address unfairness in climate responses. Uh, solidarity, solidarity with the most vulnerable. Uh, solidarity with uh, women, children, the elderly, and the poor. And then the principle of uh, scientific-based uh, decision-making, taking local and indigenous knowledge into, into account. And that last one, I think, was a very first time in a uh, UNESCO or even a UN instrument that science was so explicitly brought into as a principle of decision making in an ethics uh, uh, instrument. Uh, to use scientific knowledge, uh, knowledge with integrity in context. Uh, with respect of local and indigenous uh, people uh, as respectable 
sources and agents of knowledge and knowledge generation. Um, and in, in some people may refer to this as that principle then calls for us to avoid epistemic uh, injustice. Now, this was arrived at through a decade of work in COMEST, the World Commission for the uh, Ethics of Science and Technology. First study started in 2008. Our first report started to um, appear from 2010, and that was based on wild consultation in all UNESCO's regions with regional meetings, regional consultations. Uh, I can remember so many places where we went throughout, throughout the world. And then during uh, 2016, a draft declaration was formulated in Rabat in Morocco by an ad hoc expert group, which was also representative of regions, of gender, of age, of diversity, and of a wide range of, of disciplines. And then after the uh, initial adoption of the draft declaration, in Rabat, it was sent out for comment to all member states. And there was more than about 2,000 comments that were um, received on that. And we had to work through all of that and actually show how each and every one of them somehow re was reflected in the, in the, in the uh, declaration. Then uh, UNESCO's internal process, and then the adoption by the General Assembly on the 13th of November. And why I mention this is that that, that adoption was made by consensus. An actual vote was not called. Uh, no one actually, actually uh, abstained. Uh, there were debates, yes. There were questions, yes. But eventually, uh, this, this was adopted as um, a consensus uh, document. Now, the importance of this is that there's also what was the process that was, that was followed. And um, you, you see the words there. It was comprehensive, it was participative, it was consultative, um, and it um, represents a global moral consensus even if the declaration is not, as all the uh, types of declarations are, they are not binding like law, but that they become soft law, um, and it is, was adopted by member states of the UN system uh, in order to guide certain actions. And this places a, then a duty on member states and other actors to seriously consider the principles in the declaration in response to mitigation, adaptation, and responses. But I would like to uh, perhaps draw to a close uh, with a statement that um, the meaning of this declaration becomes tangible only in very specific contexts. And I have prepared a whole number of slides on which I could elaborate on this, but um, I would like to, to summarize that by, by just saying that um, all of these principles uh, become very much pertinent in locations, in places already uh, uh, hit uh, by the symptoms of climate change. And if we take South Africa as an example, we have experienced severe droughts. We are experiencing severe droughts at this very moment where uh, Nelson Mandela Bay, a city on the southeastern coast of the country, is within about six days before they say day zero arrives, where the, where the taps will run, will run dry. We have had that in 2018 in, uh, in Cape Town. Besides that, we have had um, on 12th of April this year, severe uh, flooding in, uh, uh, in the Durban area, in KZN, uh, 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 KwaZulu-Natal uh, province, uh, where people say it was as if a rain bomb hit the city, and it devastated infrastructure, and it devastated uh, 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 houses and homes, and, 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 and even lives, more than 400 lives were, were, were lost there. Now, the point that I would like 
to make in all of this is that where there is a possible link between what I am saying now here with the AI uh, that Emma will be talking about is that um, all of these events basically exposed the, can I say, the gaps in planning and preparation for climate change. Just for climate change arriving with us, not even for uh, adaptation to it in the long run. And what it exposed furthermore was that, um, the, exactly as I said earlier on, that the, the, the poor, the marginalized, the, uh, the unemployed, those who are already uh, discriminated uh, uh, against suffer the first and the most, and they suffer, as it were, a second and third injustices on top of what uh, they already have had. It, in it intensifies uh, uh, problems. And if AI, big data, uh, um, data science can, can, can help in, in any regards in order to uh, perhaps respond to this or prepare for this, it is in the area of, can I say, building instruments to, um, to, to, to locate, to identify, to locate and quantify um, vulnerability. Uh, but exactly how to do this the kind of scientific actions, the kind of data points, how to put that onto the ground, that still seems to be uh, uh, huge problems. And uh, with this, I would like then to, 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 to end and would like then to give it back to uh, Madam Chair and to Emma. Thank you very much, um, Johan. That was really interesting. And I really enjoyed um, your setting the scene by kind of talking more about ethics and why do we need ethics and, and what does ethics bring uh, to the table, especially the, the critical reflections. And um, I think it's very important to keep that in mind when we talk about such concepts where we talk about ethics of AI, ethics of climate change. So, I mean, there are kind of a lot of discussions in the literature about whether ethics is kind of the right framing. And I think it's very helpful to hear your reflection and to understand that um, it is a, like a, a real valuable um, angle to tackle the challenges that we have and, and the opportunities, of course, to highlight them. Um, you ended, uh, also you linked very nicely to, to Emma's presentation, which is uh, coming next, um, specifically on AI. And you did ask the question at, at the end of how do we really take it to the next steps? And it is also something that we will um, touch on uh, right uh, after Emma's presentation. I'll give you a few words on how do we implementing that AI recommendation and we'll hear and the ground reflections from uh, Constanza. So um, I think it's, it's coming together very nicely, the links between all the presentations. Um, so without further ado, I uh, would like to give uh, the floor to Emma Rutkoff Bloom. Uh, she's a professor and head of department of uh, philosophy uh, faculty of humanities at the University of Pretoria local to the conference. Um, she is the leader of the Ethics of Artificial Intelligence Research Group, AI, uh, the Center for Artificial Intelligence uh, Research uh, in South Africa. Uh, in her capacity as an AI uh, ethics policy researcher, uh, Professor Radkov Bloom, is currently a member of the UNESCO World Commission for Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology, COMEST, and, and was the chairperson uh, of the Bureau 
of the UNESCO ad hoc group uh, on the experts um, that wrote the uh, draft recommendation on the ethics of AI. Um, and she's also has a lot of um, other affiliation that will take me very long time um, to read. But what we really want to hear is um, from you and your reflections about the topic. So uh, Emma, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think the most important thing that you need to know about me is that my age and the fact that I'm a philosopher both caught up with me today. I seem not to be able to read anything, so I have various props. Um, I think I'm going to try and stand here, if I can see the slides, please, um, and then speak off this monitor. Um, I'm sorry, but um, we have to roll with the punches. Um, so I'm going to speak to you about AI for environmental sustainability within the context of the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. So um, I want to say a few things first about where we are with AI technology on a global scale. So at the moment, this kind of technology is focused on abilities of algorithms to process information at ever increasing speed and overtake human decision making and prediction capability at all levels. This kind of technology is at least as important um, as the discovery of electricity in terms of the transformation um, it brings in society, in business, in the environment, and also in terms of governance. It has immense power for good um, across the spectrum of sustainability and development goals. Um, and we should never, ever forget that even when we start wondering about the concerns and the ethics. This is a very beneficial technology for humankind, but it has immense powerful harm. From disrespecting the right to privacy to manipulating agency to the effect of basically making it disappear, exclusion of certain groups at levels perhaps not seen before in human history, disrupting the world of work and even education in ways that are sometimes difficult to keep up with, especially in certain parts of the world, and then above all, environmental harm. But before we start on all of this, I just want to make sure that all of you know what AI is. Um, so it's very difficult to give a definition for AI. People have been fighting for at least a month in the EU about the correct definition for AI to use in the, EU, in the AI Act. Um, at UNESCO, it took a few days out of our lives as well to agree on this. And it partly has to do with the fact that this technology moves so fast. But I'll go with the UNESCO definition um, for today's purposes. And we decided to define AI systems as follows. They are technological systems which have the capacity to process information in a way that resembles intelligent behavior, resembles intelligent behavior, um, including and typically includes aspects of reasoning, of learning, perception, prediction, planning, or control. Machine learning is a subcategory of AI that refers to the process by which computers develop pattern recognition or the ability to continuously learn from and make predictions based on data, then make adjustments without being specially programmed to do so. What are algorithms? Algorithms are encoded procedures for transforming input data into desired output um, based on specific calculations. Algorithmic decision making then refers to using algorithms to inform, execute, or drive decisions. A machine learning algorithm is then the method by which the AI system conducts its task, generally predicting output values from given input data. Machine learning algorithms differ from traditional algorithms in very important ways, as there is no given set of rules for solving problems, but rather machine learning systems learn to solve problems, and thus the logic of machine learning systems can change as the way in which algorithms solve problems are not predetermined as was the case in logic-based AI. Machine learning algorithms in effect change humans into data subjects, into ranked and rated objects. And this could lead to what is called algocracy, which is the practice in which algorithms structure, nudge, influence, constrain, 
control the behavior of its human subjects. And this has to be controlled and governed and implemented with care and with responsibility. So, <laughs> okay, so my coloring in the middle looks very bad. But anyway, so the idea is, <laughs> of this slide, is that usually we have the environment, the society and economy, and we have the intersection between the, those three. But now we also have to, when we think of sustainability, which is supposed to be the intersection, um, when we think of sustainability today, we have to also include technology. So sustainability happens at the intersection of the environment, society, economy and technology. And look, there are high hopes. Okay? The potential for AI-driven automated decision-making and predictive ana analytics in combination of surging progress in technologies such as sensor technology, the Internet of Things, and robotics raise hopes for, for instance, meaningful responses to climate and environmental change, speeding up progress to meeting the SDGs, and then huge potential in terms of a new kind of technology that becomes possible with AI, which is called digital twinning. And it's not your digital twin. It's not, it's not that. It's not your digital identity. It's something else. So this has to do with advanced digital replications that are created of complex and evolving systems using big real-time data. This allows immense improvement in risk identification in terms of sustainability hopes such as infrastructure development and resource consuming systems because digital twinning allows for simulation and exploration and optimization in ways that we could not have been done, we, uh, could not um, do up to now. So AI based technologies are gaining increased interest across the environmental sustainability and climate sciences. A few examples, AI applications in climate and earth system modeling, AI augmented environmental monitoring, autonomous underwater marine conservation interventions and data collection, AI supported tracking of illegal wildlife trade, very much happening with colleagues at um, Statistic at UP in South Africa in terms of um, rhino um, trade, smart urban planning for sustainable development, AI technology promise also more transparency in, for instance, supply chain development. Um, and then maybe the last one, they make for better nuclear risk assessment and better preparation, better pre-mortem analysis, better safety and safeguarding. So things look very fantastic. But then there is the other side. And I'm go only going to talk about two kinds of harm. As with any technological advance at the beginning of time, if we are really fair, there is diffusion of this technology within societies, economies, and ecological contexts. This technology shapes the world that we inhabit. And such diffusion needs to be governed carefully, especially perhaps in the case of AR technologies. So firstly, the first kind of harm has to do with the carbon footprint. So it has the potential to accelerate environmental degradation, because the carbon footprint required require to fuel modern tensor processing hardware, used for instance in natural language processing research, needs exceptionally large computational resources that necessitates similarly substantial energy consumption. And if you look at the um, image that I have on the left, it is very clear if you just look at the average human's um, energy consumption in a year versus um, what is needed to train just one machine learning model deep learning model. Okay, the second set of harms um, centered around AI technology being a disruptive technology, okay? But sustainable development and innovation also presuppose disruption. It presupposes changes to the ways our societies and businesses are organized, to the ways human recogni humans recognize their interconnectedness with the environment and ecosystems, and moreover, the interaction of AI technologies and globalization efforts lead to new and complex disruption as the world is reshaped by its interaction. So this impact on core human activities that depend on healthy environment and flourishing ecosystems, for instance, food and energy production, and it brings systemic risks. 
Risks brought about by intensified interaction between human technological, economic and social ecological systems. So here we're all for the domains intersect again, if you think of my little um, intersection that I call it. And I'm going to come back to this. Now, how do we ensure beneficial or benign diffusion of AI technologies in this situation? This is where the recommendation on the ethics of AI comes in. I don't think I'll ever be able to say these words without smiling because we worked really hard on this. Um, it was adopted in 2021, in November 2021, by 193 member states. I can tell you a lot about the whole process in question time, but I already suspect that I'm, I need to move on. But it was, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very, it was a very interesting process. We started in April of 2020. Four people from six regions around the world never met each other, had to do it online, and we did. Um, so the most important feature is that it's a global document. But then one novel core focus point of this recommendation is it, that it focuses on the protection of the environment and ecosystems. No other set of ethics guidelines had done so um, on a global scale before. So we um, contributed one whole value to this issue called environment and ecosystem flourishing and then we have a concretizing principle on sustainability um, to, to move towards implementation and then what we call the policy actions and I'll get there. But before I get to the value and the principle, we're already in the preamble and in the aims and objectives and in the scope refer very frequently to the importance of realizing that AI technologies have the potential to be beneficial to the environment and ecosystems and in order for, the, for those benefits to be realized, potential harms to and negative impacts on the environment and ecosystem should not be ignored but should be addressed. So if we look at the value of environment and ecosystem flourishing, um, this should be recognized, obviously. Um, environmental and ecosystem flourishing should be recognized, protected and promoted through the life cycle of AI systems, not just as an add-on, right through the design, the research, the design, the development, the deployment, the use, and the end of use. So furthermore, environment and ecosystems are existential, the existential necessity for humanity and other living beings to be able to enjoy the benefits of the advances of AI. So therefore, all actors involved in the life cycle should comply with applicable international law and domestic legislation standards and principles, and all AI actors should reduce the environmental impact of AI. Now, the principle of sustainability is supposed to concretize this value. That's how we the recommendation works. We have the values, we have the principles, and then we have the policy areas to make things far more concrete and move towards implementation. So the principle states that the development of sustainable societies relies on the achievement of a complex set of objectives on a continuum of human, social, cultural, economic and environmental dimensions. The advent of AI technologies can either benefit sustainability objectives or hinder their realisation, depending on how they are applied across countries with varying levels of development. The continuous assessment of the human, social, cultural, economic and environmental impact of AI technologies should therefore be carried out with full cognizance of the implications of AI technologies for sustainability as a set of constantly evolving goals across a range of dimensions such as currently identified in the SDGs. So then we dedicated an entire policy area to the environment and ecosystems and where we state that member states and business enterprise should assess the direct and indirect environmental impact throughout the AI system life cycle, should ensure compliance. And then we highlight the potential to do good in terms of the environment. So AI systems should be used where needed and appropriate to support the protection, monitoring and management of natural resources, the prediction, prevention, control and mitigation of climate related problems, a more efficient and sustainable food ecosystem, the acceleration of access to and mass adop adoption of sustainable energy, and enable and promote the mainstreaming of sustainable infrastructure, detect pollutants or predict levels of pollution and thus help relevant stakeholders identify, plan and put in place targeted interventions to prevent and reduce pollution and exposure. For this 
Member states should introduce incentives to ensure the development and adoption of right-based and ethics AI-powered solutions for disaster risk um, resilience, the monitoring, protection and regeneration of the environment and ecosystems, and the preservation of the planet. This should involve the participation of indigenous communities, it should support circular economic, uh, economy type approaches and sustainable consumption and production patterns. And very importantly, another novelty of the recommendation is that we have a principle on proportionality. And it's really important here that proportionality is then brought into conversation with in, in the context of this um, policy area where we state very clearly that member states should ensure that AI acts is in line with the principle of proportionality, favor data, energy, and resource efficient AI methods. If this cannot be done, the precautionary principle must be favored, and in instances where there are disproportionate negative impacts on the environment, AI should not be used. But now, <clears throat> moving towards um, closing, when we move towards implementation from discussing the different policy actions, we have to keep in mind certain threats to the success of the implementation of all these kinds of guidelines um, and um, suggested policy actions. And I want to um, identify four, I hope I have time, luckily I can't see any watch, so I'm carrying on. Um, so the first one is the algorithmic bias and allocation harms. There are three kinds of bias here training data bias. So there are limitations of ecological and environmental training data in terms of temporal coverage and geographical spread that we have to take into account on top of limitations in terms of social data. For instance, in the context of digital farming or conservation. Then there's something that is called transfer context bias. You cannot just carry over AI systems from one ecological, climate or socio-ecological context to another. You can't focus on industrial farming and then try and carry over those principles to small rural farms. And then there's also something called conceptual drift that occurs because of changing land and seascapes. So it becomes very difficult to align um, the transfer of context. And then there's something called interpretation bias that um, refers to the lack of understanding of outcomes of AI systems. Just because an AI system predicted something or generated an outcome doesn't mean everybody understands immediately what should be done or, you know, that what should be done, that is suggested to be done necessarily is the right thing to do. So we move to the second kind of threat that has to do with unequal access, benefits and impacts. Small-scale farmers and fisheries are responsible for a huge part of global food production, no matter how you look at it. But there is a mismatch between increased productivity and resource efficiency via AI technology on the one hand, and on the other, lack of access to these very advances and being left behind in the process anyway, if you're a member of these um, communities. And then there is tension between the World Bank and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization focus on increasing aggregate food production on the one hand, while on the other, ignoring underlying well-known socio-political issues such as food insecurity, driving food insecurity such as poverty and so social inequality. If we don't take this into consideration, we can have principles until they are blue in the face. Nothing will come of it. Um, the third threat to successful implementation, complex interaction leading to what is called distributed AI. Approaching human technology, human, human, human ecology and technology ecology, ecology interactions through a complex adaptive systems lens may, if combined with AI technologies, lead to the emergence of distributed AI. This has to do with centralized systems that have the ability to bring together information and agents across levels and domains at the same time as they partly autonomously react, adapt and learn proactively to changing certain circumstances. They are well-known benefits. Um, from a distributed AI, from energy network resilience to social resilience, but these systems are open to unexpected endogenous shocks or normal accidents having to do with operational failure, and which ha may have severe negative impacts if they occur in complex contexts, for instance, in regional food supply chains, and they are open to malicious um, and external cyber attacks. Um, you know, AI sometimes makes me think a little bit of breeding, say, dogs, the purer the breed, the more vulnerable they become to certain kinds of illness. 
AI is a lot like that. Um, the fourth threat, AI efficiency and resilience. Optimal system performance to maximize efficient generation of a small set of goods can negatively impact overall functioning and resilience of a system. This can cause so-called regime shifts, which may impact, uh, imply irreversible changes in a given ecosystem. For instance, high yields of specific crop species versus loss of biodiversity and being able to regulate climate and floods. And then a really important point, tacit sources, cultural and spiritual practices of knowledge, ecological and farming knowledge through the ages, play an important role in supporting the resilience of particular communities and ecosystems. But this may be lost due to big data's role in sustainability sciences, and we don't want that. So we have to find a way to, to not have that. So in conclusion, last slide, we have to keep in mind that risk from application of AI technologies in climate, ecological and sustainability sciences occur in high stake settings. We should understand that difficulty, the difficulty of quantifying climate and environmental risks and cost, as Johan also referred to, may negatively impact on the implementation of responsible AI guidelines. Important, responsible AI for sustainability requires us to understand the context of AI, the infrastructure it is built on, who develops it, who owns it, who has access to it, who uses it, and what it is used for. If we have this kind of understanding, we can start figuring out answers to the following three questions. How can existing principles of responsible AI and similar guidelines be leveraged to also advance sustainability ambitions? What governance mechanisms could support synergies between environmental and technological regulation in ways that minimize systemic sustainability risks? How can such mechanisms be developed in ways that are adaptive to both technological and environmental change, including climate disruptions and surprises at the same time? So UNESCO, in this sense, is a front runner because it put these kinds of questions on the table in the context of ethics guidelines on AI technology, and UNESCO is offering global support in trying to find solutions to these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, that was a great um, presentation. Thanks for running us through, walking us through the um, the recommendation and also providing the the risks that you talked about at the end. That kind of like set the ground for the implementation and how a good implementation of those instruments uh, can be done. So after we talked about two instruments developed uh, by UNESCO, we can switch gears to talk about implementation now a bit more in details. Uh, I will just want to give you a very, very brief uh, overview so we have time for the, the consensus presentation and Q&A um, of how we are implementing the recommendation on the ethics of AI. Because as uh, both Johan and Emma said, uh, we have the, the principles and, and the values. They, they are very good um, instruments that take, go in the direction of what should be done. But we have to take the extra mile, uh, which is a very hard uh, task to unpack such big principles and come up with operational. So traditionally at UNESCO, uh, the way we, we work on implementation is through capacity building with member state, uh, states, for example, through building educational resources, both for the general public and for teachers. Um, so um, the knowledge can be implemented and uh, passed on uh, more directly. In the context of bioethics, we are we have been also working on the establishment of national bioethics committees uh, with experts from each country that are aware um, of the social and cultural kind of considerations that must be taken into account and can can work on implementation in a more contextualized manner. Uh, in AI, we have uh, in the recommendation the mandate to create two quantitative tools. Uh, readiness methodology, a tool that will ass assess countries in terms of how prepared they are, they are to um, 
adapt AI technologies in different contexts. So preparedness is in terms of dimensions, uh, like how, how much their regulation, their laws is um, strong uh, enough um, to, to balance the pros and cons of the technology, but also uh, how, how ready they are economically, scientifically, technologically, etc. And the second tool is the impact assessment, the ethical impact assessment that will assess specific algorithms in, in terms of how ethical they are and how uh, safe they are to implement in society. Um, in addition to those, after we have the results of tools like the readiness, we know where countries stand, then our plan is to deploy experts, local experts as much as possible that will help countries to fill in the gaps, bridge the gaps and um, change what needs to be changed or at least start the change. Uh, we're also working on the establishment of a network of women in ethical AI as, um, as we also found out that uh, gender equality is a topic that is um, not tackled enough in the domain dis despite uh, the severity and the need for uh, enhancing gender equality. And we will also have a yearly uh, global forum, which will be a platform for countries, but also other stakeholders to come uh, together and share uh, best practices and what they have been doing in terms of implementing the recommendation. All those, of course, are in addition to the uh, fourth yearly requirement on member states to report back to us and to tell us how they implemented each one of those instruments. Um, okay, so now another um, layer of implementation, I think that we will hear about from uh, Constanza. Uh, so Constanza gomez Mont is a social entrepreneur and AI policy strategist who founded women-led uh, think and action tank, Sea Minds, which advances the positive social impact of new technologies in Latin America. Among her leadership roles, Constanza is the co-chair of the AI for Humanity Global Future Council of the World Economic Forum, member of the drafting group of the AI uh, UNESCO recommendation and um, co-designer of uh, FAIRLAC, the Latin America and Caribbean initiative led uh, by the Inter-American Development Bank um, to accelerate the ethical and uh, responsible use of AI by governments uh, and uh, enterprises uh, for social services. Moreover, Constanza also co-founded and uh, led the global initiative AI for Climate, uh, which promotes the conservation of biodiversity by harnessing emerging tech, tech uh, community-centered approaches. Uh, thank you very much, Constanza, for joining us. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Loa. Um, hi, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here virtually today. I'm sharing about the groundwork we're leading on AI for conservation and how actually instruments like the AI recommendation and the recommendation on the ethics of climate change can be used as tools to enforce accountability and inclusiveness and fairness throughout the life cycle of a project. So today I'm going to share a bit about what we're doing on the ground. Um, before I do that, um, let me tell you a bit about AI for Climate. Um, it has the objective of driving the use of ethical and human rights based AI forward um, through the knowledge sharing internationally of best practices and cross pollination among sectors. We're very keen on understanding where comes the magic between the AI sector and the conservation sector, and especially how can this be done ethically, um, understanding both the risks and the considerations that have to be taken into account. Um, our first living lab that we did through the AI for Climate Initiative is called Tech for Nature Mexico. It is co-founded actually by the um, by C Mines AI for Climate, the government of Yucatan, IUCN that is international in reach, Huawei's Text for All initiative, and has the participation of the Polytechnic University of Yucatan, 
rainforest connection and the local community living around the natural reserve. And there is an alarm going off in another apartment, so sorry for that. Um, the project is implemented actually in the Yucatan a Peninsula in Mexico. I did a map for those of you who have not had the pleasure to go to those um, beautiful areas of, of Mexico. Um, our five main goals uh, for this project include uh, to develop AI systems for mangrove ecosystem health monitoring and jaguar conservation, create value for the reserve for the future potential emission of green and blue bonds, contribute to the generation of a baseline for the assessment of conservation success based on the IUCN green list standard, and also, as we saw with the recommendation, enabled data-based policies and decision-making. And parallelly and important as well, is we've asked ourselves, how can we create local talent? And instead of being an organization that comes to an area and pretends to know um, more or, or less or anything, how can we embrace local knowledge? Especially, this is an area that is very rich in the Mayan indigenous group culture. So the question of how do we embrace um, all this ancestral knowledge and bring it in into a meaningful way throughout the entire life cycle of the project um, is, is important. Um, so why mangroves? Um, we were especially interested in working in this area of mangroves in the Yucatan Peninsula because of their role as natural nurseries for species and are home to a great biological diversity. And in turn, these ecosystems, as we know, provide services of great environmental, economic and social value, especially as natural barriers that reduce the vulnerability of coastal areas. Yeah? Sorry, yeah. sorry to cut you. I think there's a problem with your... Um slide sharing or uh, because uh, the organizer put in the chat that you are not seeing the map? Yes, if you're not seeing the map, then there is a problem, definitely. Um, <laughs> Maybe that. you want to retry? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. I can you see now. it now? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Can you Thank confirm? You. Oh, oh, wonderful. Well, you missed my magical maps. I'll just put a map of what <laughs> is because I do believe it's important for you to, to understand uh, geographically what I'm talking about. Um, as for the rest, there are amazing pictures of the site. I will share the presentation if needed. Um, but as I was sharing, um, basically mangroves were uh, are a very interesting um, area and our area of interest, especially because of the vulnerability of both the environment and the social vulnerability they bring when they're not in a healthy um, state. So moreover, uh, mangroves are a key source of carbon capture. Um, in other words, blue carbon. And actually uh, we learned that mangroves are capable of creating a carbon reserve of 50 times greater than a tropical forest. Um, Mexico basically has more than 5% of the world's total mangroves and it has a lot of areas that are recognized internationally for this. And apart from the, the importance of the mangroves in this area and for the region and continent, um, the, the, it has a home to an endangered species that has been and is one of the most representative species of the Americas and the indigenous community, which is the jaguar. In the Mayan culture, the jaguar was one of the most important symbols representing power. Actually, the character who wore a jaguar clothing were persons with authority and importance in society. In many Mayan ruins, you can actually see the jaguar representations like this one that I'm projecting here. So the value and importance of this animal is intrinsic and also transcended the past of time and cultures. However, this species is an extinction and thus we urgently need ways to protect them and their habitat. So the question we at CMINES and AA for Climate and our partners asked is how can we harness the power of uh, automated systems and the power of multi-sector collaborations to amplify and accelerate conservation efforts in the site? And most impo importantly, how can we do this having an ethical and human rights approach in the heart of every step of the project? The challenge of this area, as you can see with my picture of me trying to navigate this amazing site, um, is that um, this site, as in many other parts of the world, um, getting access and going here on foot is quite difficult. And also the areas are so extensive that um, processing data manually is not even sometimes possible. Um, so both the time allocation, research allocation, and human allocation sometimes tamper with the correct data-based decision-making and correct uh, conservation efforts. 
So as you can see from this um, place, you know, you, when you go there, you have biomass that comes up to your knees. In the good days, we have lost multiple shoes there. So the question is, how, how, how can we embrace these new technologies and emerging technologies in an ethical way to be able to amplify these efforts? So what we're doing is we installed the eco-acoustic monitoring sensors um, for the ecosystem level monitoring. Um, basically audio moths to strengthen um, the monitoring and conservation and the understanding of the effects of climate change on biodiversity. We partnered up with Rainforest Connection. That is an organization that has a lot of experience using these audio moths in different parts of the world to understand about their technology, understand about their best practices, and then be able to adapt and create one that is specially created with the local context here and for this peninsula. Um, these graphs are from other projects, but this is what we expect um, for a project, which we're at the very early stages of. Um, we're going to be monitoring, for example, species richness, animal vocalizations, and human activities. Also, we're using camera traps to collect video in strategic places. And this actually helps us specifically for the jaguar and other priority species identification. Um, parallelly, we're working with the students and professors of the Polytechnic University of Yucatan to create um, image analysis algorithms, training an algorithm to detect jaguars, for example, and also be trained to identify exactly what jaguar has passed in that area, um, depending on the individual spots of each jaguar that has been identified. Um, apart from allowing local institutions, including the government that is partner of this project, to improve conservation efforts for the Jaguar. Um, these automated analyses will help also prove the data that is needed to create Jaguar protection corridors. So what's happening right now is that there's diverse protected areas all throughout the region, but there hasn't been enough data to prove that a corridor is needed for a Jaguar to go from point A from the furthest point of the reserve to the end. And this data, which we're very excited that we are already having initial data points for this, will make the case that a corridor has to be established and not only for the state, but rather going into Central America. Until here, I have shared the strategy that has been set in place for the use of AA systems, but also it is very important uh, for us to walk the talk when it comes to the ethical and human rights approach um, that we're committed to in this project. And the recommendation on the ethics of AI of UNESCO has played a very important role for this. So I have a few minutes left, so I want to um, focus on three main points that have been part of the recommendation and that we have been um, very curious and committed to implement in this project. First is ensuring diversity and inclusiveness. A second, the security and right to privacy and data protection. And third, the environment and ecosystem flourishing. Um, for us, inclusion is a value that is embedded in all stages of the life cycle of the AI project. Um, we consider this to be inclusion by design and should be prioritized as much as the AI ecosystem has prioritized privacy by design in so many ways. One of the first strategies to this end that we had was the creation of a steering committee that was inclusive by design. So there are members of all sectors. We have the academic sector, the government, the NGO sector, international multilaterals, uh, companies, and us as the innovation agency um, bringing everyone together to form the governance of the project. Um, yes, sometimes it's difficult because perspectives vary a lot. However, we believe, we truly believe that the richness of diversity in perspectives is the one that is making this project integral in a lot of levels. And moreover, in the problem definition and design phase, we strongly believe in, in that inclusion by design means bringing the community, the local community, that in this case is a Mayan indigenous groups, um, into the uh, project meaningfully. This for us does not mean having them as a consultation group where sometimes feedback is asked in an isolated maybe manner, but rather having uh, a seat at the table at the steering group, being part of every stage of all the life cycle. Um, and this, um, it is a project that is in the very early stages. Actually, this is a, a photo of us uh, launching the project some, some months ago. But um, we can share some lessons learned on this end on inclusion. One is the need for an open and flexible lab type philosophy throughout the entire life cycle, because the amount of iterations we have had to had um, when we brought different stakeholders in to the original plan was great. 
This means time allocation, this means resource allocation, this means sometimes coming and disintegrating everything that we have made and starting again. However, um, that's lesson number two, the, the steering committee shares the values of inclusion. And I wanna emphasize this because if the steering committee or the people that are taking decisions behind the projects, would we would have had a different value settings I think the opportunity costs of being inclusive by design on, on the practical terms would have suffered a lot in terms of agility of the project, time of the project, and resource allocation. So being all of us understanding that inclusion by design was a top priority of a project allowed us to navigate sometimes complex questions in an easier manner. And third, uh, as well, um, allocating budget for meaningful participation has also been key for us. So sometimes we believe that uh, if we invite the local community to an event, for example, or to workshops, um, we normally had to do it all the way around. We have to go to them basically. And understanding that their time in, in projects is considered as, for example, consultants in another way. Understanding what are fair contributions for time and effort, and also understanding and, and being adaptable completely to all levels of literacy. So when we're talking about AI projects, it's very easy for the jargon to come in and to start um, talking about very complex terminology and the true sense that one of the key factors of this project has been to understand in a very profound way the need to make um, understandable the processes, that this has led into more explainable and understandable um, processes of the project. However, for us, it has been a wide opening on how the minute you create a common language, a very simple terminology to understand maybe sometimes complex technological processes, um, participation and enthusiasm and joint vision becomes more of a reality. Um, and also um, an inclusion has meant for us not only inclusion of different perspectives and for example, female programmers and the development of the algorithm, but also asking ourselves a very, what I believe a very important question, how can the benefits of a project like this one be shared as well? So that we're talking about inclusion at the outcome level. So on our end, what we're going to start doing at the middle of the project is start to have workshops and become a sounding board for the local community and how can they use the program of this uh, project and how can they use everything that has been created, including the networks, to be able to bring more economic activity. This has the form of, for example, green sustainable tourism of um, showing tourists how the audio must work um, preparing them to give workshops of, of how um, these IoT systems and AI systems help them conserve in a better way, um, a learning expeditions, etc. And also, um, I want to emphasize the gender. I believe that in the recommendation of the, of the ethics document we did um, with UNESCO, gender is as well as environment a priority. Um, to be very honest, this has been a challenge um, to be able to, to really have this indicator meaningfully because we're in a, living in a context in, me in Mexico, but I believe this is globally, where there's not a lot of women in this sector. And also where the local communities, when they ask for, when we ask for a representative or someone, normally um, uh, there's very uh, few women included in these processes. So what has meant for us is just slowing down everything and just trying to make sure that we do have these indicators in place and that these indicators are very public to be self-accountable to our community and to ourselves of the importance of this factor. And finally, um, inclusion means in these type of projects, not only people, but as Emma said in, in her presentation, the inclusion of the voice of, of species. So um, what happens in a project where you're kind of tampering with the, with the natural habitat? How do you make this in a way that is very respectful of the habitat, of behavior patterns, and that we mitigate any risk of really disrupting um, the natural habitat? So for this, we have brought a group of experts that have uh, the, they advocate for the species um, throughout the entire life cycle of the project. And I am sure that this will be fascinating to, to explore. In the one minute that I have left for this presentation, um, I do want to emphasize that the right to privacy and data protection in projects like this one are sometimes thought that um, maybe they're secondary, but indeed, for example, that what we've seen in this type of projects is that the data sets of the, where the Jaguars are in the reserve 
are as priority uh, to be secure and safe and not be leaked um, because of the poaching poachers, because of um, its sensible data that if it gets out there, um, people would could have it in a maluse. So this has taken us to the uh, protocols of safety and data protection. And right now we're exploring, exploring the tokenization of documents and uh, information to be able to do, share these data sets through the partners and with the community on a safe side. Um, at the end of the day, um, what we're seeing is that global instruments such as uh, the UNESCO one, which I'm, I was the honor to be part of the 24 amazing uh, members globally to draft this, is that now that I'm on the land and on ground, seeing every number of that recommendation, what does it mean on site? I believe that there's so much to learn um, from all of us as a community and so much collective action to take place that I am very keen on understanding other and learning from other best practices, especially from Africa and continuing sharing how to make operation and how to operationalize um, documents like this one in conservation efforts locally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Constanza. That was really fascinating. And that really kind of brings us our work to the first to the next level. Efforts like yours um, and others that really takes the recommendation and try with all the challenges anchored into that to implement it in practice. Um, that is really that is really helpful and that is really what kind of will help us to develop more global uh, best practices um now let's uh, move on to the questions and answers um i think we will start we already have we already have um questions online uh, that I'm seeing, but let's start with the online, uh, with the on-site participants. Uh, we are pretty short on time, so let's take two questions, and uh, we will uh, then take the online que questions. Uh, so, uh, professors, uh, Professor Burton uh, on-site will help us to pass the microphone and give the permissions to those who want to ask questions, um, please. Thank you, I, I will do that. So we will just take a couple of questions. The first one down here. Um, and if anybody else has a question, if you could just indicate where you are so that I can ask the microphone carriers to bring it to you. Okay, so we'll take your question second. Erica, over to you. Thank you so much, Erica Key from Future Earth. Um, thank you to all speakers for everything you shared with us today. Um, I'm just noting that uh, many of the large-scale AI powerhouses are private sector, and given the carbon footprint of um, these decision-making tools and the fact that they're looking to turn a profit, how does the UNESCO ethics guidelines apply to these private sector entities, um, such as the Huawei partnership that was mentioned in the last um, presentation? Does this apply to them as well, or are they outside of this domain? Let's hear the second question as well, and then I'll ask our uh, on-site speakers if they'd like to to answer those. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, Professor Raymond Auerbach, Agricultural Research Council and um, South African Organic Sector Organization. Um, in the latter capacity, I work a lot with small-scale farmers and connecting organic farmers with technologies and with um, markets requires the development of apps on smartphones if you really are to help people access. Um, we have been involved in creating an organic knowledge hub around Africa, Northern, Western, Central, Eastern, and Southern African knowledge hubs. And there is a lot of information out there, but the, the problem seems to be putting it into a form that can really be useful to farmers, especially given, given the multiple languages of Africa, and also uh, putting it into a form um, that can um, be context specific because organic agriculture is very much related to, to context. So I see these as two major problems of artificial uh, intelligence and I see the, the, um, 
the difficulty being that very often the technologists are familiar with a particular context and they kind of assume that that context is okay for everybody. So how do we deal with this? Thank you. Thank you. So let me invite Emma and Johan to make some responses and then I'll hand back to Doha and Constantia. Thank you, Professor Burton. Um, um, to the first question, oh, sorry, but I think maybe my mic is working. Okay, sorry. I, <laughs> so today is very weird. Um, so um, on the first question, yes, big problem. The UNESCO recommendation is, um, uh, uh, what's the word, directed to member states, um, given the nature of UNESCO. But we took great care to introduce, um, you see from some of the quotes that I had, that we say member states and the business, private business sector. So we tried to sneak them in um, as far as is possible. But the idea is that the recommendation would now be implemented within different countries and that those countries will come up with their own national um, ethics guidelines and that those guidelines then would be binding um, to the, the, the private sector. The, 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 the big problem obviously is also that these big companies are transnational um, companies and so it's very hard to get a hold on them. But what is most important is that we have to understand that we are our own best weapon against them. Literacy and awareness. If we don't use their apps, if we keep questioning and coming, standing up for our rights, that is where it hurts them. So we also, the ordinary person also has a role to play as far as that is concerned. I don't want, know if you want to add something to that before, or must we go to the second question? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, just very briefly, I would like to, to uh, re reiterate what Emma said. Uh, in the climate change uh, de declaration, it is also addressed to state actors, but also other sub-state actors, and there are a long list specifying specifying them, uh, which means that these recommendations and instruments are, are in a sense, global, which has its own problems to say that. Uh, and, and especially in the climate change declaration, the, um, the principle of solidarity speaks very much to the sharing of information, early warning systems, benefits uh, of, of, of any kind of te technology that is, that is uh, developed. Thank you. Do either of you want to make a response to the second question? I'll give it a try. Um, yes, those are very important questions that you raise. I think one of the mo most important um, points that AI technologists have to keep in mind is that they cannot operate in the little technical world. As a philosopher, it's fantastic to sit in my ivory tower and do my reflections and come up with my formal logic um, formulations, but the challenge is on the ground. So we have to learn that the tech community has to be in touch with the people on the ground that will be using the, the technology. And in the terms of the two issues that you raised, which the one kind of touches on the, on the problem of interpretation bias and also context transfer bias, um, and then exacerbated by the, the, the language problem, um, because if you think in terms of natural language processing, large language models are basically trained on on the, the languages that are spoken most often or most um, um, across the world. But in South Africa, we have, I have two answers for you. Firstly, the Masikane project, which is a South African um, uh, uh, originated project that focuses on natural language processing of indigenous languages and has now been developing, um, or what's the word, expanding across Africa. This is an extremely important group and we have a data science for social impact group at the Department of Computer Science um, uh, in the, at the University of Pretoria, which also drives projects such as those exactly to be able to bring that kind of technology to the very communities that need them. In terms of the, 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 the context transference, I think it is just important to work with the communities, to get the tech team 
on the ground, with us, with the example that Constanza gave us. The tech team should be on the ground and should speak to the community. We cannot have these silos and these abstract, and also in terms of the ethics. Okay, ethics is bottom up. Um, it's not something that's forced. It's not some abstract thing. It, all of this has to happen in synergy. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. You Thank go. you, Emma. Uh, sorry. To you. Uh, thank you very much, Emma and Johan, for your responses. I'd like to ask Constanza if you have any quick reflection before I read uh, two online questions um, and then give you all the chance to react to them as your uh, closing remarks. But before that, Constanza, would you like to react? For sure. Regarding the first question, um, I strongly believe that all of us have a, a very um, important responsibility on energy consumption. Um, while the transformation of the big tech corporations takes place, which I believe is crucial and urgent, projects, for example, like this one that is local and focalized, also have an important role in, in considering and acknowledging the carbon footprint of the AI systems and everything. The car uses, the boat uses is to go and monitor a species and take the cards, um, camera cards off. So what we've done in this project, at least, is acknowledge this white elephant up front, understanding that we will have a carbon footprint and then um, designing strategies, one, to measure the carbon footprint beyond the algorithms and the energy consumption, but onto the land practices on ground site and also finding the best ways to carbon offset these. Um, our aim is to go carbon negative in this project, which I believe should be a goal for projects like this one on ground. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, very useful example. Um, I'll read two questions, and as I said, I'd like the speakers to react and, uh, and then use it as an opportunity also for a closing remark because we are very uh, short on time, last uh, five minutes. So the first one is from an online audience. I worry that I worry that the conventional policies might fail with AI. One reason is that you don't need a license to develop AI, nor do I think we need to. So have we considered how policies slash ethics can be um, immersed into complex adaptive systems that do not need that do not respond well to policies um, controls. That's the first one. And the second one, AI is fundamentally accelerating development. What are the two design options you suggest we can use um, to ensure the gap between have and have not, uh, especially poverty and education, does not increase? Uh, Costanza, I will start with you and then we bring it to the onside, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you. I, I Can someone else start? I did not hear the first. Uh... It cut off? Sure, I think you can also see them in the chat. Oh, perfect, I'll see them. Uh, Emma and Johan, who would like to start? I can, I can, I would really want to speak on the first one, um, the first question. I think it is, um, it's extremely dangerous for us to get caught up in all these policies and to focus, over-focus on coming up with all these values and principles. And um, although debates about the different cultures in which these guidelines are um, formulated are extremely important because here in the South we are excluded mostly from those kinds of conversations and um, that should um, change um, very fast. But the, the, the real challenge is, and that's, a, that's, a pro, that's an issue that we picked up in UNESCO in the recommendation also, is to concretize these, these principles. And that is why we have the policy, we identified policy areas where we then unpacked um, policy actions to try and concretize um, the, the principles. But what is important also is that the tech community should understand there is a there's a lot of methodologies and libraries available for instance to check that your algorithm is fair 
um, that there is no bias, um, that it is transparent, that it's explainable to some kind of level. But these are not only technical issues. These are ethical issues as well and human rights issues as well. And the only way to to have the best impact in terms of ethics is to have a multifaceted approach. Ethics should be part of every stage of the AI system life cycle. It should be enabling. If it's a tick box, if it's an abstract thing that's pushed from the top, run. It should be bottom up. It should be part of how these algorithms are um, structured and th that is also where policy should start focusing on and the AI Act actually um, will do a lot as far as that is concerned. Certain kinds of technology will simply not be allowed to be developed. Um, in terms of the second question, I think I would, um, Constanza is the best person to answer but I, um, uh, and I think we'd, we, we may not have time so I'll <laughs> shut up for now. Thank Thanks. Um, yes, um, so um, I, would only, I would also add to Emma's point on the importance of incentive mechanisms. So for example, having protocols and standards and certifications that company can adopt and can users can, valid, um, can see and recognize is, is, as we've seen in our context, as important. And on the second question, um, AI, AI is fundamentally accelerating development. What are two design options you suggest that we can do to ensure the gap. Um, for us, I cannot talk generally, but for us in this project, at least, what it has, um, we're very focused on how to bring a participation meaningfully from people that are not part of the tech sector. What does this mean for us right now is understanding what meaning is for, for different populations and then understanding how the project can bring benefits to those meanings. Um, we have a lot to learn from, and I think one of our main lessons is that knowledge is horizontal. I believe that sometimes there is an arrogance of the of the AI ecosystem that comes with you know all these fancy terminologies and fancy technologies, and not recognizing that there is a horizontal and very important cross pollination needed to effectively do this in a in a human human and ethical approach way. Thank you, Constanza. Johan, last uh, reactions and reflections? Yeah, uh, last but not conclusive. Uh, <laughs> very briefly, I would like to, to uh, emphasize the point that uh, complex adaptive systems, uh, climate change ethics, AI ethics, technology, governance, policy making, all of these things are so intertwined that it is so, so difficult to, uh, to disentangle them. And that is why we uh, need models and modeling and mathematics and uh, perhaps even s simplifications and always uh, need to ask uh, what are the effects of these models, uh, policies that we make. What do we include? What do we exclude? Which borders do we, do we draw? Um, and then to critique those borders, ask the justice questions, who are included, who are excluded? Uh, what are the effects? So I think in, in, in this place of uh, complex adaptive systems, intersections, uh, entanglements, uh, uh, we, we find that ethics, governance, everyday actions, industry, um, they all intersect and overlap. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that there are more questions online and I'm sure on site as well, but unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, we really wanted to bring you the experts that are doing super substantive work on the field, but not less important that are close friends of UNESCO. In fact, in fact part of the UNESCO families and are very much aware of the challenges that we face while developing those instruments and trying to implement them people that are involved in those um, processes with us uh, on, a, on a daily basis, almost really. Um, and I just want to say, this is just an, I, to give you a general idea of what we are working on, especially in the context of the AI, the implementation of the recommendation just started recently as it was only adopted the, six months ago. So if you would like to be involved and if you have suggestions for us, uh, please get in touch. 
uh, we are very open to hear and to interact with all of you. And we have, as I said, many opportunities, as I kind of briefly outlined uh, the plan for the implementation. Uh, would love to continue this conversation. I would like to thank a lot the speakers, um, Emma and Johan for being there in person um, and Constanza for joining us. Thanks a lot for taking the time and from sharing uh, the important work that you do in this field. I wish you a good day and uh, a, a great uh, continuation of the conference. Goodbye. Thank you, Constanza.